Hello, everybody. And first of all, thank you for, uh, for the, the invite. Thank you for having me here, and thank you for this beautiful gathering. Um, today, I'm going to... Um, so, actually, I'm uh, Mohamed Endaou, the PhD student at CREST, uh, under the uh, supervision of Alexander Tsibakov. And today, I'm talking about some uh, work that has been uh, done a while ago, which is about the construction of uh, fractional Brownian motion uh, while I was uh, in an internship at Bloomberg. Um, so, what I'm going to talk about today is first I will give you some motivation of what I'm going to present today. Then I will talk about something that is uh, called the uh, series expansions for, uh, for continuous stochastic processes, but it would be just very basic uh, things. And then I will show you how, um, uh, uh, what I exactly did to construct this sort of a, a, an expansion of fractional Brownian motion. And maybe at the end I will give you some further research direction. All right, so. Uh, first of all, what is fractional Brownian motion? So I guess that everyone in this in this room knows what is exactly Brownian motion. So think of it as a generalization of the Brownian motion, and with this new degree of degree of freedom, which is h, the Hurst index. So when h is exactly equal to one half, then it's this is just the Brownian motion that you can see in the in the uh, the the blue uh, the blue path. And whenever h is bigger than half, then the the increments gets uh, positively correlated, and then you get something more nice and smooth. And when h is smaller than half, like the the red uh, the red path, then your increments are negatively correlated, and you get something very rough. Uh, so these are the, the three examples of uh, fractional Brownian motion. And actually, it's given also by it's a central Gaussian process before, uh, after all, and it's given by this covariance uh, structure here. Mm? And for the purists, uh, it's a fractal as well, and so it has uh, stationary increments, and it verifies the self similarity. All right. So, so among the applications of uh, FBM, I'm going to talk only about the financial application because I did this uh, while I was in a, in a, in a finance company. Um, and uh, actually, in the for those who are familiar with stochastic uh, volatility models, so we usually model the prices as low as uh, log prices as semi-merchant gallows and the volatility as a semi-merchant gallows as well. And it turns out in the, in the recent work of Gadrol and Rosenbaum and other guys that the log of the variance is quite is somehow very rough. It's something very more rough than just a semi-merchant gallows or just a Brownian motion. So here I have a simulated data which is a fractional Brownian motion with h very small, 0 0.15, and it looks similar. So this is uh, one of the motivation behind um, trying to simulate this fractional Brownian motion. Um, now the problem uh, in practice is the simulation. We don't, we don't know exactly how, uh, we don't have some efficient tools to simulate a fractional Brownian motion. So think of it if you want to simulate a, um, a Gaussian process, but uh, you have some increments that are not independent, then in this case, what you do, the first thing is the Cholesky decomposition you can think of. Just take the covariance matrix, try to take this, do, to get the square root of this matrix, and multiply it by some independent uh, Gaussian variables. And the problem is that to get the square root of a matrix, you need to diagonalize, and then this uh, is of n cubed complexity, and it's quite a lot to pay. So another method is uh, what we call the approximate circulant method. And um, basically, the idea is to, as I said, uh, the increments are stationary, and you just take the covariance of the increments. And uh, since they are stationary, then all the diagonals would have the same components. So the idea is to modify the lower triangular part in order to make this matrix circulant, uh, a circulant matrix, which is just cyclic uh, up to some shift. And in this case, we know exactly what, what is the diagonal, uh, the eigenvectors of a circulant matrix. And then it's easy to get. Uh, to, to do uh, the diagonalization in this case. The problem is that it's just an approximation, so it's not an exact method. So the last idea and the last thing we, uh, we can use is our series expansions. And the good thing about these series expansions that is that they are continuous in time, so we don't have to discretize, uh, to take points in some grade. They could be uh, continuous in time. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, about series expansions for continuous stochastic processes. So uh, basically what we, are, we will always suppose here is that think of, uh, of k, of this function k as a kernel. So it's a symmetric kernel, okay? So it's an operator, the, the operator gk is quite very, is famous in the literature. It's just this linear operator that just takes the inter scalar product between the kernel and a squared integrable uh, function. So the two conditions we always assume are the first one, which is um, the Mercer's condition, is that just the, um, think of it as a, in a finite dimensional case, this is just saying that the matrix is semi-definite positive. Uh, this Mercer condition is exactly the same as saying that your matrix, your your matri the matrix of the kernel is symmetric positive. And this is just saying that the trace is finite, basically. Okay, so these two conditions are usually verified. And when they are verified, actually you can show something that looks like the spectral theorem which is actually that you're, uh, there exists a, um, 
a set of eigenfunctions and eigenvalues such that it your kernel could be, uh, could be diagonalized in this space. Uh, so it's exactly the spectral theorem for uh, semi-definite semi semi -definite positive matrices. So it's got something generalized here, and it's uh, something very true for uh, compact operators. And actually, the, uh, the series converges absolutely and uniformly and all the, the stuff. Because of this trace condition, we have uh, all these convergence uh, results. Uh, one of the applications is uh, for people who are familiar with machine learning is the kernel trick. And basically, if you have from this formula, you can write a kernel as a scalar product in some inner space. And this tells you that you can see any kernel as a scalar product. And then you could uh, basically you could just uh, do as if you were in the Euclidean uh, space. Uh, why do I show you this Mercer theorem is because there is a very beautiful theorem, which is the KL decomposition, <laughs> that tells you basically that think of a, a Gaussian process uh, that is centered. Then actually this, this process depends on two things. The first thing is time, because it's time dependent, and the other thing is the omega, which because it's random. So we have these two parts. And this, the beauty of this formula is that it completely separates the randomness from the, the time dependence. So you could write your, your process actually like, a sum of a product between some random variables and some time-dependent functions. Uh, so you somehow completely separate the randomness from the, the time dependence, which is something very beautiful. Uh, and in the specific case of Gaussian variables, we know that the ZKs are exactly independent Gaussian variables. So the general version of the theorem is that if the process is not Gaussian, then this is still true if the autocovariance, the covariance function is continuous. It, it would always be true. But in this case, the ZKs are not known. We don't know what are exactly the, the type of the, uh, uh, the, the randomness of the ZKs. They're independent, but not, uh, the, they're just decorrelated, sorry, but not uh, independent. So this is, I will give you just an idea of how to get this, um, this proof, because it's something that we will, we will, be, use, uh, will be using. Is, uh, think of the Mercer theorem. It tells you that the kernel can be decomposed this way. And it also tells you that the eigenvalues are positive, because this operator is semi somehow semi-definite positive. Okay, so now if you, you, t you decide to construct this thing, this very simple thing is that just to take the square root of the eigenvalues, okay, think of it, take it because it's positive, you can take the square root and multiply them by some, say you pick some independent Gaussian variables and you construct this series. So if I tell you, and trust me, this series is a conversion, is a conversion series, then the you just need to take the covariance of this, this thing and the covariance of this Gaussian process is exactly KST. If you take the covariance because ZK are independent, the covariance would be exactly this thing above. Okay? So this is very useful in simulation because if now you know the KL decomposition, you just have to pick some independent uh, Gaussian variables and multiply them by the, the, eigen the basis of the KL decomposition, and it will give you something that has exactly the, the correct covariance structure that you are looking for. So this is something very useful. Uh, now, where, where is the pro all this is a, a beautiful theory, but the problem is that I think for several years, people were to, uh, have been trying to find the KL decomposition of the fraction of Brownian motion, but unfortunately, no one succeeded. So we don't know explicitly the KL decomposition of, of the fraction of Brownian mo motion. We only know it for the Brownian motion, but it's useless because uh, we don't need uh, this to simulate a Brownian motion, which is, uh, can be simulated linearly. So this is why uh, we're trying here to give not a positive answer to what I just said, but to find another series that is not decay decomposition, but that will have exactly the, the same rate of decay of the decay decomposition. Um, and uh, to give you some, uh, some intuition about the, the how I thought of this construction is, um, remember this operator that I have showed you in the beginning, this TK here, okay? Remember this operator? So we need to diagonalize this, uh, this operator, okay? So now think of a stationary process. Uh, if, if the process is stationary, this means that the kernel KXY can be written as some phi of uh, f of some x minus y. You can always, if you have this stationarity, if you have the stationarity, you can always write your, your kernel uh, as, a, as a function of the difference uh, in absolute value, okay? So whenever you have this stationarity, you can actually see your operator as just a convolution operator. Uh, and we all know some basic things we have learned are the, uh, the eigenvectors of the convolutional operator are just the Fourier basis, okay? So actually there is something very deep between stationary processes and harmonic analysis. Whenever you have something that is uh, stationary, somehow think of a uh, Fourier basis because it, the, it's something very, very, link, very linked. Uh, okay, so this is what, what I exactly did. So I said, okay, let's, uh, let's just take the autocovariance function and try to take the uh, the Fourier decomposition of this function. And why do I write it this way? Because here the CKs actually are, um, 
uh, we can show that the series of the CKs, because they, are, they have this, of this order of growth, we can show that this, the series of the CKs is convergent. And in this case, the Fourier series is not normally convergent, so uniformly. And then you can replace T by zero, and you have zero in both sides. So you can, actually, I'm just replacing the DC component, which is C0 by the minus the sum. So I can write it this way. It's just because I like to write it this way. And the CK are given this way. So the thing that, that now we, we should keep in mind is that what we did is that we, ha we, we, we keep the same covariance structure between 0 and 1, but basically outside of 0, 1, then it's a new covariance structure because in this case it would become periodic. So what we are doing is only valid between 0 and 1. But something that we really uh, need to keep in mind is that th this new modified covariance st structure is not necessarily a covariance structure. Uh, so it does not really verify this new matrix. That it has nothing that is not obliged actually to be semi-definite positive. Uh, so it's not a covariance anymore. So just take what this this um, what we did and we replace it in the covariance KTS. So we replace it here and you do some simple trigonometry on this function. And something very interesting ha happens here is that actually just by doing this simple thing, we can write actually this KTS, which is the, the kernel, as the sum of a product between some, some functions that are uh, of some basis. Okay, so there, there are these functions, these uh, eigenvalues, which are minus CK, times some functions, some product between FT, FS, which is very similar to what we had in the, kernel, in the Mercer theorem. The problem is that, remember what we did uh, for the KL decomposition is that we just said that minus the eigenvalues are positive, so we could take the square root, okay? So in this case, we, d we have, there is no reason for minus CKs to be positive. If they are positive, just take the square root and do the same thing as in the KL, and then you will have something that has exactly the correct covariance structure. So the question is that, do you know any function such that all the Fourier coefficients are positive or all of them are negative? So this was something very, uh, very weird uh, when I first thought of it. Uh, well, is it really possible for a function to have all the coefficients positive or negative? And then, as a very novice person, I just decided to see the spectrum, how, how it looks like. And the surprise is that actually for h smaller than half, they all are actually have the, the same sign. So they're all i. Mm. So they all have the, the same sign. So it's very interesting actually. So the CKs or the Fourier coefficients are negative in this case. So minus CKs are all positive. So for H smaller than half, it's very simple. You just need to take the square root and, well, this is surprising, but uh, I think I was, I was lucky when I first uh, f found this. Then I said, okay, let's see for H bigger than half. And in this case, you can see that the Fourier coefficient does not have the, don't have the same sign. In this case, we need to do something more um, to work a little bit more to make this work for H bigger than half. So uh, just to get uh, an idea of why is it working for h smaller than half, think of minus ck, you can write it uh, this way if you do some integration by part. And actually this, two, uh, th this is just the product between two functions. This is t power to h minus one, and this is uh, the sign, the sinusoid, okay? So the integral of the product is just, uh, this is the product of these two functions, and the integral is just the sum of all these small surfaces. As, and as you can see, all these surfaces are decreasing in amplitude, so the sum of all of them would be positive. So this is why these coefficients are always, would always be uh, positive, actually. And actually, if w when you really think of it, there is something deep about this singularity around zero, and this singularity around zero is what makes things work, actually. Whenever you have this singularity, things work, and even the, the equivalent of CK at the infinity is depend on this singularity around zero. And it's something very interesting. And this is why it does not work for h bigger than half, actually, because we don't have this. For h bigger than half, we don't have this singularity. We have something that is equal to zero here. So the result is this one. Maybe uh, now for h smaller than half, then xt is exactly can, can be written this way. So this series is exactly a fractional Brownian motion with the correct, uh, with the correct covariance structure. And we, uh, we can prove actually with some, well, some very classical tools that uniformly this series has the optimal decay, which means that you cannot find any other series decomposition such as it would be uh, faster than the one we are presenting here. So it's by far the, it's not the only one, but it's by far the, the rate optimal one. And um, uh, just I'm giving you here some example of simulation of the variance and here of the, um, the covariance structure in three dimensional. Um, just to give you an idea of the existing series, so this is the first one with uh, Zafar Zid and Van Senten. And uh, for their series, you need to find the zeros of uh, roots of basal functions. You need to know also gamma of something. And this is another one where you need beta, gamma, and another beta. So 
the idea is to tell you that this, this series is somehow very simple. Just take the FFT of uh, T to the power TH with your favorite uh, uh, programming language and then multiply it by some cos and sine. You will have a series that is exactly doing the same thing. Um, the case of H uh, bigger than half, just to in in few words, remember what I said, we really need this. If you want, there are two regimes. There is this regime of H when we are smaller than 0 0.5 and we have this singularity here. In the, in the middle of both, we have the function which is exactly T. And here we, are, we have something, another T to the power two H, and the last one is T to the T uh, squared. So the idea is to try to do some uh, mirror and uh, symmetry here in order to get the singularity again. And the idea is to consider the function T to the power two, which is the other corner, minus T to the power two H. And in this case, for H bigger than half, this symmetric function of the autocovariance would have the singularity around zero and then we would do again the same thing and it would work uh, exactly the same way and it would be optimal. Uh, so this is, there is a, actually the machinery I showed you here uh, is basically for fractional Brownian motion but it could be generalized to a large class of Gaussian processes and, I, and I, this is what I did in the, uh, in the paper is whenever there is some stationarity, either of the process of the increments, you just can use this Fourier basis and uh, by uh, looking at the singularity, whenever you have a singularity <coughs> around zero of the autocovariance function, you will have something that is optimal, that has optimal decay. So I do this for fractional or St. Olympic, fractional bread and uh, other, many other processes. And um, uh, the takeaway message is that these series expansions are very interesting for simulations uh, because actually the something deep about them is that Basically, what you need to do is just to truncate the series, so you need to, to keep n number of harmonics. So in this case, you don't choose to discretize actually the, the time. You, you choose to discretize in the harmonics. So instead of this, you have something that is continuous in time, but then this time you need just need to pick the right number of harmonics that you can exactly control by this formula. So just from this formula here, you can know exactly what's the number of harmonics to put in order to get a good precision. Uh, so you just need to, to take the, the good number of uh, harmonics. And the last point is that this series could, could, be, um, could have some potential uses, for example, for estimation of the Hurst index or the drift of these uh, fractional uh, processes. Uh, it's not very easy, actually, because um, the basis is not orthonormal, so you cannot just project and get the, an estimate of the coefficients. But if somehow there is a way to find an estimate of the CKs, then we could potentially get an estimate of the Hurst index or drift or many other things. This is pretty much all I wanted to tell you here. If you have any questions, uh, I'd be happy to answer, or otherwise we can talk about it offline. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Is there any question? Uh, the last, uh, last force, uh, oh. I think there is one, one picture of the, of the analysis of error. I'm sorry, what? Can can you show us? Which no, no, no. What? There is an image, uh, a photo of uh, of the. Um, you you have uh, passed it uh, very quickly. Uh, where where is it exactly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the the, the one with the color balloon. Okay. Yeah, and uh, next one. Yeah. What what does it mean? Uh, this is this is just a, the the covariance. Uh, this is just a rough. Uh, well. This is meant to be the covariance, which is meant to be continuous, but in this case, because I, I have chosen just a small number of harmonics, it's something a little bit rough. So it has, a, it does not, it's not exactly the correct, uh, it's an approximation of the covariance. Okay. Because uh, I, I've just picked maybe 10 or 20 harmonics, first harmonics. Yeah. But it's, it should be the covariance function, two-dimensional covariance function, the kernel. So, so, so we see that uh, at the corner, there is one peak here. Here? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a peak. So it's why? I don't know. It's just uh, the similar. It's very rough actually because for h smaller than half, as I said, it's, it gets very rough actually. And then yeah, this is why I have this. Uh, it's not very smooth. Yeah. And is there any wavelet basis approach to uh, fractional yes. motion? I think there, there is another one. Um, not uh, about uh, with the Taku and another. Yeah, I don't remember exactly their name. So th they have exactly a series expansion, which is not uh, very easy. Uh, it's like basically you have two indices, uh, so it's two different base of wavelets, and th the series uh, it, it, it involves some Gaussian independent variables, but it's a little okay. bit involved. It's not explicit actually for okay. simulation, so it's not very useful. It's I not think. explicit. Okay. Mm. Ah yes. Uh, so uh, uh, on on the blackboard, 
Uh, on, on the blackboard, uh, you explained uh, when h is larger than one half, you can transform the covariance uh, um, function. Uh, and h how is the new covariance structure related to the old one? Actually, the, the idea is um, because what, what I did in the beginning is I, I considered the Fourier decomposition of this function. Okay? And because of the singularity, the Fourier coefficients were like all positive or all negative. Yeah. So here, instead of considering this guy, the idea is to consider the Fourier decomposition of this new guy because it would have this singularity. But of course, at the end, I'm paying something. In my series, I would have a, a term which would be something that looks like C0 times T times Z. Uh, I have a small term to add up to my series. But the idea is to modify your, the thing that you are going to do, uh, the Fourier basis, in order to have the singularity. And then you, uh, you just subtract something at the end. There is a small cost to pay, but it's nothing. Uh, well, it's OK. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So now, Marianne.